1973 had seen the first ever British Christmas number one war between Slade's Merry Christmas Everybody and Wizard's equally upbeat I Wish It Could Be Christmas Every Day. And so the following year, chart-topping glam rockers mud seemed like a natural choice to punt for the top spot, which they did with an unusually doleful Elvis pastiche, Lonely This Christmas, which reached number one today in history in 1974. Yeah, and to say that the preceding 12 months had been good for Mud would be a bit of an understatement. And now, look, they'd started the year with 1974's biggest seller, uh, which was Tiger Feet. <laughs> that's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. That's right. I really liked Tiger Feet. That's a joke about Tiger <laughs> Feet. <laughs> we were both alarmed. <laughs> <laughs> you had some weird meltdown. <laughs> oh, he's buffering. What's happening? <laughs> but those are the words to Tiger Feet. Right. Joke. And so then they had a number two... With, that's uh, right. That's uh, right. <laughs> no, I, won't, I, won't, I won't keep doing that. It was quite. It, it was very similar. I mean, it's funny that you're doing the same joke because it was a, a sort of sound alike. It was called "The Cat Crept In," and then they had a respectable-ish number six with Rocket. And the idea that they should go for the Christmas number one was the idea of Nicky Chin and Mike Chapman, who are a writing and producing duo known collectively as Chinny Chap. They had been writing for Glam Rock Axe, The Sweet, and Susie Quattro. I mean, they thought. Let's go in, let's do a Christmas hit, you know, because I was surprised 1973 was the first time there were, you know, there had been yeah. Christmas themed songs before, Dickie yeah. Valentine, Christmas Alphabet right. back in the 50s. Yeah. But this was the start of the battle for the number one Which spot we're still in. Christmas. I mean, yeah. the era yeah. that here in Britain is still a thing. Like people who don't pay attention to what's at number one for the rest of the year We'll read a newspaper article at least about what is going to be the Christmas number one. And go, no, yeah. never heard of it. I'm like, interested <laughs> in it. They'll say all things aren't as good as they used to be when I was a kid. Who is this rapping man? Um, <laughs> and of course, the other big contender was Wombling Merry Christmas by the Wombles. There was Christmas Song by Gilbert O'Sullivan and yeah. Hey Mr. Christmas by Shawadi Waddy. Both feel very 70s. There was also, good Lord... <laughs> Father Christmas, Do Not Touch Me by The Goodies, which is about a young woman I, I, being sexually assaulted in her home by Santa. But looked at now, even though you'd think the Wombles have the credentials for the kids going out and buying the, the songs, Mud are kind of like the perfect band for a Christmas number one because they were once described as the carry-on team of rock and roll. It kind of tells you everything you need to know about Mud, <laughs> that after their first three singles flopped, what eventually launched them was an appearance on the Basil Brush show. <laughs> so that's the band we're dealing with Rock here. and roll. Yeah, so it's like, they are the right act for Christmas number one. I mean, he was the Ed Sullivan of the UK. Right. You know? <laughs> and they kept reinventing themselves. You know, they had various looks, which I suppose for the time you consider the fact that David Bowie did the same thing thing and uh, you know this isn't unusual but they sort of hit on this winning formula this was their moment and I think that the song is actually a good one you know that 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 quite aside Hot from the fact there, that they're <laughs> one of the favorite Christmas singles of all time well, they're actually things, all right there are things this year <laughs> I mean, that it's I have... Merry Christmas Wombles <laughs> there are things this year that I've said that uh, that you know the British psyche <laughs> is taking Don't on tip and, to and, and, <laughs> and enjoying that aren't necessarily so good. But this is actually, you know, quite a good uh, song. And I think that Les Gray's performance as a sort of Elvis wannabe tribute act, the, the elements all come together and work. Okay. He said the E word, Rebecca, so I feel we have to go into the Elvis thing. One of the extraordinary things about this record is that there is still this enormous misconception that it's actually Elvis Presley singing it. There are even uploads of this song on YouTube with millions of views called Lonely at Christmas by Elvis Presley. <laughs> yeah. When it's actually Les Gray doing an Elvis impression. When you search for it on Spotify, one of the suggestions is Elvis. <laughs> right. Blue Christmas by Elvis, right? Yeah. Which obviously inspired this song. This is like a mashup of Blue Christmas and Are You Lonesome Tonight, really? Mm. But that's what's so weird about it. It's like, what's the motivation here? Because it's not like it's the Christmas song that Elvis never recorded, because he'd done loads of Christmas songs. <laughs> well, and it's actually the Elvis pastiche, Shall Only This Christmas, beat actual Elvis, who at this week was number seven in the charts with a song called My Boy, which is not familiar to me. I'm guessing that's not one of his. No. Nope. <laughs> Wasn't one of his best, probably. But interesting that they beat him mm. with their impression of him essentially actually the funny thing is listening to it with fresh ears you know for this episode it's so obviously an Elvis pastiche but mm. when you've heard it since forever mm. I mean this came out before I want to say before any of us were born mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Arian's not that old you, right you just about full, get through with that full looking guys <laughs> yeah. but when you've been hearing it forever like it's so easy to miss that context I don't think I've ever consciously thought this is an Elvis pastiche even though when you listen to it musically that's clearly what it is mm. but it's so part you know, the Christmas fabric. And the Elvis thing was never explicitly explained at the time <laughs> either. As far as I can work out, it was 
recorded in a sarcastic spirit, but at the same time, it's very genuine that Les Gray was an enormous Elvis fan, as his 1981 album Rock on Elvis proved. You know, he liked singing like Elvis. And actually, if you listen back to all the other Mud songs, he sounds a bit like Elvis. It's just that on this occasion, he was allowed to let rip and fully do it. Mm. So it's kind of, again, like everything to do with them. They're kind of joking, but they're kind of a serious band as well. Like, I don't think they knew what they were doing. Mm. Well, and we're right in the middle of the 1950s revival, which occurred in the 70s, where you so had... So also our episode on Greece. Yeah, so you had Greece, you had Happy Days on the TV, and the chart at the time was full of retro covers. So in the mid-70s, you had Ringo Starr's cover of Your 16, you had the Carpenters' cover of Please, Mr. Postman. Even Mud had done Oh Boy, a cover of the Buddy Holly and the Cricket which song. Which is terrible. And then you had stuff like Crocodile Rock, which was obviously a retro-inspired new track. Mm. And then you had new hits from rock and roll stars of the 50s. So My Dingaling was the number one UK single of 1973. It was just this really odd music era where one week Slate's Come Feel the Noise was number one and then the next week it was Donny Osmond's cover of a Johnny Mathis ballad from 1956 called The Twelfth of Never. Like that's what was happening musically at the time. <laughs> yeah, the world was really trying to decide which direction to go in. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're starting to see like 2000s fashion revivals now but I can't imagine seeing a 2000s music revival or even a 2010s music revival mm. happening now but mm. also and not so specifically and obviously aping the style of an icon from that period you know if someone did a song that was a bit like Amy Winehouse they wouldn't literally go on top of the pops dressed as Amy Winehouse that would just be really weird <laughs> which is what Mud did Wait, not as Amy Winehouse but as Elvis not as Amy Winehouse yeah. <laughs> the top of the pops staging was kind of an evolution of what they did in the official video because obviously a slow song is actually quite difficult to pull off in a group especially when we hadn't established boy bands and standing up key changes etc so the original staging is actually quite awkward they basically sit around in wicker chairs in their white jumpsuits it literally looks like the conservatory of a care home for Elvis impersonators <laughs> that's what they look like you've got Les Gray sort of half-heartedly lip-syncing the bassist Ray Styles is miming so much really pulling focus and the drummer has literally nothing to do like there's no drums happening so he's just like humming in the background like a drunk uncle and so when it came to their appearance on top of the pops on Christmas day they realized perhaps that they needed to add color and possess yeah and they took that in a weird direction no <laughs> they did and it, it seems inexplicable <laughs> it does but there is it a story actually is Explicable. Explicable. <laughs> Let me explain. Go, go, go. <laughs> Explic away. <laughs> um, so they've got this ventriloquist dummy that's sitting on Les Gray's lap. Mm. And you have the, in other ways, it's a relatively conventional Christmas setup. You've got a tree and you've got this fake snow being poured on them. Which is fun by itself, by Which the way. Which is fun. Yeah, because yeah, you can see the stagehands scuttling yeah. up and down the ladders just off to each side so, of the stage, yeah. hurling the hurling. snow. So the joke is you can see the mechanics of what's going on here. That's yeah. kind of funny. Yeah. And then you've got this ventriloquist dummy that he he's kind of talking to and then sometimes it's singing the song. Gray told an interviewer later that the whole business of the song is fairly easy to mime until you get to the spoken word component. Yeah. Miming that, spoken words is hard. Yeah, it'll just be instantly a thing that the audience can spot. And yeah. so he brought along this dummy to do the spoken word bit and that's, that's where the dummy takes over. Yeah, so the idea is like if Top of the Pops are going to force us to mime then we're going to sort of... I mean, it's clever because it's kind of at the one time it's showing up Top of the Pops. Right. But at the same time, it does conveniently get around the fact that he would be obviously miming if it went on him. And again, this song, like it's got that Venn diagram of being both serious and taking the piss. And I think there's a real like poking your finger in the wound pleasure in listening to bittersweet songs, especially at Christmas, when I think people are open to having big emotions. Mm. Unlike Fairy Tale of New York, it doesn't have a homophobic slur in it. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got, you've got the downbeat That's lyrics. Useful. But, yeah, I mean, you know, pretty don't feel dirty really after and singing along. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, obviously, yeah, Fairy Tale of New York being a big one. Obviously, Blue Christmas, the, you know, the original Elvis Christmas song that he actually did sing. Even stuff like, um, you know, like Little Drummer Boy, Peace on Earth. There's like mm. a melancholy to it. There's a minor key aspect. Even Last Christmas, like that's a jolly upbeat song but you know the lyrics are about being betrayed and abandoned at Christmas mm. <laughs> you know even stuff like I remember buying Mad World by Michael Andrews and Gary Jules I remember literally listening to it in my dark bedroom and thinking about like how soulful yeah, I was yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then your mum said Rebecca turkey's ready you went skipping down the stairs in your pyjamas <laughs> I love Christmas <laughs> <laughs> and so ends another curious moment from history Subscribe now to hear more from Arian, Rebecca, and Ollie, the Retrospectors.